On behalf of the Kentucky Valley Education Cooperative, we would like to welcome you to our fourth you know, micro-credential summit, uh, our virtual edition. Uh, our past three, we're able to have our face-to-face -face, and we're excited to be able to continue this conversation uh, with you and with others from across the nation via our, our, our Zoom meeting. But as we begin, we just want to talk a little bit about uh, who is the Kentucky Valley Education Cooperative and why are we hosting these national summits? One of our missions with KVEC is to ensure that we build upon human capital and that our members work together uh, to face the pervasive challenges that are addressing our rural area. Due to our size, our geographical location, we try to focus our efforts on opportunity, access to professional learning for our students and our teachers, and ensure equitable allocation of resources for all those in the region. Part of our work is to focus on changing the narrative of our region. Often you hear stories about what's happening within our KVIC region from those who are limited in the understanding. And what we're trying to do is to share the renaissance that's occurring in this area uh, that's being led by our school systems, our educators, our students, and our community members. And at the fulcrum of this work are our national summits. We have several different types of national summits, micro-credentials being one of those. What the Microcredential Summits allow us to do is to join in with others from across the nation, from Hawaii to Maine and beyond, to network and discuss transformational competency-based professional learning for our educators. Uh, these summits enabled us to examine relevant research. They let us use our collective minds to learn together, to build and find impactful solutions to issues that address rural areas of our, of our nation. Uh, especially more than ever in this digital age, a focus on virtual forms of learning that are authentic, job embedded, that engages educators uh, through meaningful learning opportunities, and they transform classroom, uh, classrooms, schools, but most importantly, transform the learning environments for our students. And micro-credentials are one important tool in that endeavor. Uh, so, who do we have in the room? We don't have, I don't have identified names. We'll be talking about that in just a moment. I'll go through these very quickly to let you look at the types of organizations who have joined in on this conversation with us, either for this session or the other sessions, or that uh, are interested in, in, in having conversations with us in, in, uh, throughout the, uh, the course of our micro-credential work. So as we thumb through these, you might see yourself identified. You might see others who are, uh, that you might want to reach out to and develop some networking opportunities with. But you'll see as you look through these, it's not just organizations at a national level. We have local school districts. We have state agencies. We have local uh, departments of education. We have universities across the nation that are interested in conversations regarding micro-credentialing. And as we move forward, our first keynote today will be our, uh, through Dr. Jennifer Carroll. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Carroll is our professional learning lead at the Kentucky Bell Educational Cooperative. And she's gonna guide us through the, the learning systems of micro-credentials. This is micro-credentials 101. So she'll be talking about what they are, what they aren't, the development of those, walking us through the development, what the, the design principles associated with micro-credentials are, uh, the completion scoring, and other things around research that and, and reports that are part of this work. Uh, Jennifer has created and worked with educators for, for several years on developing micro-credentials, and we are, feel very fortunate to have her today. And with that, uh, I'm going to let you go. We do have the chat function, so at any time you have questions, uh, you do have the chat function to use. I know Dr. Carroll has uh, opportunities she wants to engage with you during uh, your, her session through chat. So let me uh, stop this and I will turn this over to Dr. Carroll. Okay, can you hear me now? All right, now we can go, good. Okay, um, 
since KVAC launched into the work of micro credentials a few years ago, um, we have really become immersed in the work and really working to try to connect ourselves to as many people as we can who are interested in exploring the idea of competency based professional learning. So it's really exciting to get to um, talk to you all today. Um, you specifically selected this session because you wanted to connect and learn more about micro credentialing. So it's going to be fun to have a chance to get to talk to you. Um, in the chat box, if you don't mind, drop an introduction. Um, tell us your name and your role and um, what agency you're with um, and where you're at. And this is a really great chance for us to connect with each other and for us to also grow our professional learning network because obviously an hour is not a lot of time to um, delve really deeply into a topic, but um, through technology, through the ability to connect um, virtually through email and other ways, we can, um, can, we can continue this conversation after this session and after our um, additional virtual micro-credential summit sessions have, um, have concluded. So it'll be really great to have an archive of the folks who participated, a little bit about their role and a little bit about where they are. So our targets for today, our first and foremost target is to be able to network with each other um, to advance our understanding and our application of micro credentials within a system of professional learning. So really, this is this is about making the connection um, through that we will do we'll do some introductions about what a micro credential is. We'll explore a sample micro credential to understand a little bit more about um, what one looks like. Um, we will explore a little bit of micro credential research, some that has been done by um, some institutions of higher education and some that have been done by, by us here at KVEC. And then we will consider a plan for continued learning. Um, if you have any other objectives that you would like to try to accomplish in this hour, also drop those in the chat box. We have folks that are monitoring the chat box and um, we'll pause along the way if there's something that we need to stop and address. So Robert gave you a little bit of an introduction about what KVEC is. Um, we are one of nine educational cooperatives in Kentucky. Um, we were founded in 1969 to address the needs of the rural districts that we serve. We are the state's oldest educational cooperative and our geographic area is about the size of the state of Connecticut. So if you can think, you know, that's a pretty large geographic area to cover. The picture that I put up there is actually a picture of Hazard and that is where we are physically located. So you can see how blessed we are to really be able to live and work in a place that looks like that. So um, if you've never been to Hazard, we invite you to come visit us. Um, you, you will like the scenery. Um, this is just a little bit of the demographics about who, who we're serving. Um, 23 school districts, which is about 139 schools, more than 3,000 teachers and 50,000 students. And it's important to understand that as a cooperative, we are non-regulatory. So all of the work that we do with our schools is in support mode. Um, and we are the primary professional learning provider for our schools and districts. Um, we definitely operate under a um, strength versus a deficit approach. And when we talk about that, we mean we're really focusing on what are the strengths, the talents, the connections that we can make among and between the schools and the educators and the students that we serve to help them advance their um, educational outcomes for their students, for their educators, for their schools, and for their communities. And we do a lot of that work through network approaches. There are a lot of different networks that are facilitated by KVEC. Everything from um, innovation grants that teachers work on together to um, shared leadership teams through activating catalytic transformation, special education um, networks. We really work around the network approach to be able to connect each other to those practitioner experts in the field because we really believe in the strengths of the folks that we serve. And um, just you can read the mission. I don't have to read. I don't have to read that to you. But as Robert said, we are really about building capacity. We are about building the capacity of our districts, of our schools, of our administrators, and our educators and our students to help them learn with 
and from each other. So we are so much about building capacity. So thinking about where we are located geographically, we know that family elements and poverty deeply affect performance. We know that those are two key aspects of our demographics. But we also know that while we are very aware of how important the role of the teacher is, effective teachers are best identified by their performance, not by their knowledge. So we have to think through that lens as we're thinking about professional learning. How are we impacting an educator's performance versus just their knowledge? And we have some challenges, like other states do, around providing professional learning. And when you think about professional learning as a landscape, and we know how important it is to advance the professional um, practice of the educators who are working directly one-on-one, face-to-face -on -one, -face with our kids every day, we as a state in Kentucky, we are entering our third biennium of zero dollars from the state for professional learning. So that poses a huge challenge in how we still have a mandate for professional learning, but our school districts do not have any funding from the state in order to keep that going. So that, that is, that's a barrier. And we've had an opportunity probably about this time last year to have a conversation with our last K Kentucky commissioner. And something that he told us is, cause we were asking him, you know, what's the forecast on funding for professional learning? How are we gonna get some dollars into schools to work toward that? And he said, um, let me tell you where the rub is. You know, as legislators are hearing from teachers, their constituents, their teachers, that professional learning is, is not relevant that it's not um, productive, that they feel like they're not getting anything out of it. So when a legislator is looking at a budget for school districts and they're thinking about what to cut, and in this ear they're hearing from their constituents that professional learning really isn't being beneficial, you know, it's sort of a one-shot deal, everybody gets the same thing, or it's not relevant to my needs as an educator, then it becomes the first thing on the chopping block. So we have been able to engage in, in wonderful conversations with our Department of Education moving forward about how we change that paradigm, that, that, that vision of what professional learning is. And I really love this quote about um, he who studies medicine without books sails an uncharted sea. So we can study medicine, we can study teaching all day long. But until we are actually able to practice our craft in the context of our work, then we're not going to go to see it all. So you know, I think about that in terms of this quote also from Bloomboard. Um, uh, I am entering my 30th year as an educator, and I have done a lot of professional development for superintendents, for principals, for teachers. I've, I've done a lot of professional development and I've brought folks in for two hour sessions, three hour sessions, six hour sessions on topics that you know, maybe were relevant to them. Um, but at the end of the day, when they are leaving and I hand them a certificate, that certificate really only says, you did a really great job of sitting in that seat today because I'm not able to see what they take back to practice in their classroom. I'm not able to see the impact of that on their professional practice. And I am not able to see the impact of that on student outcomes. So it's not about a lack of knowledge. It's about how do we give teachers the opportunity to actually practice in the context of their work in their classrooms or give administrators the opportunity to practice their craft within their school building with their school communities that's where we're going to see the impact of professional learning and that's when we can change the conversation so that legislators are no longer hearing professional development is not relevant legislators can start hearing I have to have this opportunity for professional learning because it's changing my practice and it's changing what's going on with my kids. And we really truly believe that micro-credentials can be a part 
of changing that conversation. So we, we titled this session Micro Credentials 101 um, because it's really meant to be just an introductory session. So I'm kind of interested in knowing where you feel like you are in your continuum of learning around micro credentials. So you might be, hmm, I think I've heard that word before, you know, I've read about it, I've heard the word. Or two, I've been exploring micro credentials, really thinking about how they might work in the context of, of, of what I do every day. Or three, I have, I've earned one. I went out on a limb and put myself out there and I earned a micro-credential. Or maybe you're actually in a role of, of an issuer. You're issuing or developing micro-credentials. Or you're at a five and you're, you have a key role in terms of developing, assessing, recognizing, or um, adopting policy regarding micro-credentials. So I'm really interested in kind of knowing where everybody is in that. And I'm kind of trying to multitask and look at the chat box as we go. And um, we have folks from, from all over. Um, and good. So I see some fives. I see some four fives. I like the, I like the 2.5. I like to straddle the fence too. <laughs> I don't want to commit one way or the other. So that is great. That is great. Well, I hope somewhere as we go on through today that even if you're at a five, we give you something to think about that, about that next level of learning because micro credentials are so new in this area of professional learning um, that maybe we can um, extend our learning a little bit more. So as we think about a definition, we have to first do that. We have to establish a common um, mindset around what a micro credential is. So a micro credential is a competency based certification of a discrete skill. So it's very much focused on a skill or a competency that is demonstrated in the context of work. I, I tend to uh, many times talk about micro credentials in terms of teachers, but micro credentials they've been around for a while. They were really used heavily in the medical field. Um, so they're sort of a, a, a late comer to education, but anybody in the field of education from teacher to administrator, there are micro credentials that exist for those roles. So sometimes if I say teacher, know that I'm, I'm talking about educators. Um, I'll, I'll try to correct myself, but sometimes I forget. So we're really talking about competency, the ability to demonstrate a competency around a specific skill. So we're talking about an impact on professional practice. I'll have somebody who did tabulations for me on where our numbers are. So the majority of our folks are at the one, two level. So I think you picked the right session. I think you're, you, you um, personalized your professional learning need and picked the right session. So I'm happy to have you here. I, as a former teacher, I used the Frayer model a lot with my students to help them to understand a concept. And I think part of the Frayer model where we think about characteristics and non-characteristics or is and, and um, is not, it's a great way to frame our thinking around micro-credentials. So when we think about that micro-credential being a certification of a skill, we have to remember that it, they are about demonstrating competency that they are very much personalized. There is the opportunity for an educator to seek personalized professional learning. There, if you take assessment, for example, there are hundreds of micro-credentials that exist around assessment. I have to dig deeper to find what is that skill, that discrete skill about assessment that I need growth in. That, and so with that, micro-credentials give the opportunity to really um, tune in to my personalized professional learning need. And they, they are self-directed. They're self-directed in that I can work on this micro-credential um, on my own time, just in time. But there is also the opportunity for me to have coaching and guidance from a mentor who helps me to understand what my professional learning needs are so that I can seek that personalized professional learning from a micro-credential. 
They are a digital form of certification. So um, in almost all cases, when an educator earns a micro-credential, they will receive a badge that says that they have earned that micro-credential. And we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what's hidden under that badge, but I just wanted to make sure that we um, clarify that I just want to clarify that the micro credential is um, usually awarded with a, a digital badge. So we had a question in the chat box about are micro credentials always completed in a digital manner. If, if an issuer is um, of, of a national entity and they are working with a partner, um, maybe such as Bloomboard or such as Digital Promise, and it is hosted on a digital platform, then that micro-credential is earned in a digital manner. But we have schools now that are thinking about micro creating their own micro-credentials based on the needs of their staff, and those do not necessarily have to be completed in a digital manner. But the digital format um, helps facilitate the feedback process because when you earn a micro credential, um, the issuer or the assessor is going to give the earner feedback around whether or not they successfully earned the micro credential or whether or not there is more work needed. And that platform helps to facilitate that process. But we even ha also have some schools who have so immersed themselves in educators earning micro credentials that they are creating opportunities even for students to earn micro credentials. So they can be kind of tangible hard copy kinds of things but in order to um, ease that facilitation of feedback and then to earn that digital recognition of here's the badge that says that I have this skill the digital format helps to facilitate that so that's an excellent question um, we also know that the micro credentials are about clinical learning and application. So a, a micro credential should be about an educator practicing the skill in the context of their work and collecting evidence and artifacts of that. So just like a nurse who is on clinicals, who is learning the practice, walking the halls of the hospital, in the hospital room, working with patients and providing evidence that they are able to care for that patient, a teacher or an educator is doing the same thing with a micro-credential in a clinical format. Um, Micro-credentials are guided by feedback, and I think that is one of the most wonderful things about the process is that if you are not successful the first time you submit your evidence and artifacts for, a micro, for earning a micro-credential, the assessor will give you feedback to say, mm, according to this criteria that we have set out in, in the micro-credential, you're almost there but here's still what, what, we, what we need in order to see that you have truly demonstrated that competency. So the feedback is a key component of that work. And a micro-credential does not have to be completed in isolation. When micro-credentials were, were sort of new in our region, we had a lot of people who were just sort of seeking them on their own. They were, they were, and all of them weren't even telling people that they were working on them because they didn't want anybody to know if they weren't successful the first time. But what we have found is that when you create that opportunity for educators to work together in a professional learning community around a micro credential, then that opportunity for collaboration just expands. So, um, it does not have to be completed in isolation. If you have a team of first grade teachers who are working on a micro-credential around um, formative assessment, the classrooms they apply their learning in are different. The lessons that they develop to demonstrate that strategy are different, but they can be helping each other. They can be giving each other feedback. They can help each other with the upload process if they're maybe not tech savvy. There are a lot of ways that um, folks can collaborate on these micro-credentials that make them a true um, collaborative learning community kind of experience. And micro-credentials are not about seat time. And that is one of the hardest conversations to have with folks who are, who are starting to enter into the, the world of micro-credentials because 
in our state, and I'm sure most states, they, um, the currency for professional learning is ours. Teachers are, are, are required or administrators are required to earn X amount of hours. So when teachers have the opportunity to earn a micro credential, then their supervisor is wanting to have that conversation. How many hours is this worth? And, and that is a, those, those are the kinds of things that need to be driven by local policy. Those are things that um, states can't determine, that co-ops can't determine. Those, those districts have to have those conversations about how, if, if we have to work within the constraints of hours, then how are we going to, um, what currency are we going to give these micro-credentials in terms of hours? We definitely know that one size does not fit all in terms of micro-credentials, that um, if there are 35 micro-credentials around student engagement, then I need to find the one that, that meets my learning need. Um, a lot of folks who are new to micro-credentialing may come with the construct that a micro-credential is like an online course or a MOOC, um, and they are not. They're, they're very much self-directed learning. A micro-credential will have some information embedded in it, but depending on an educator's entry point into the micro-credential, they may need to dig deeper um, and do more research and, and um, consult more resources in order to develop their learning. Um, I'm not going to continue on with all of these because you can read them, but I will, I will go back to that last one that micro-credentials are not automatically scored. There are people behind those micro-credentials that are giving feedback to the earners. And so if you are um, familiar with micro-credentials, you can probably add more to this. Um, we only have so much space on a slide, but if you want to add other characteristics or non-characteristics to the chat box, that gives people folks, that gives folks some other things to think about and to consider. Jennifer, there's a question there from Melissa Tooley. Okay. The question from Melissa is, do you see these as the ideas for micro-credentials, or are you saying that all micro-credentials currently being offered have all these characteristics or non-characteristics? And I'm going to say that these are aligned, and we will get into this a little bit more soon. Um, there has been some collective work done around micro-credentialing, um, around some national design principles. And so while some micro-credentials may not all look this way. Um, if we follow those national design principles, then they should look this way. So we'll, we'll just kind of leave it with that, but I will show you those design principles and we'll see if that helps clarify that question a little bit more. And I do appreciate, I do appreciate the question so much. So um, Robert and I had the opportunity to be part of a national collective to really, um, think critically um, and collaborate to discuss and to, to, and to develop guidance for those who were involved in, micro in, in this whole ecosystem of micro-credentialing to really think about what are those core elements of design of micro-credentials, assessment of micro-credentials, and implementation of micro-credentials. And so um, I have linked this, um, these design principles in the PowerPoint. Um, so when you receive the PowerPoint as being a registered participant in this session, you will have a, a direct access to the link. But of course, with the wonders of Google, you can Google it and you can find it um, as well because um, the Council for Chief State School Officers, CCSSO, does have it linked directly on their website. And I wanted to show this because um, kind of tying in to Melissa's question, um, KVEC has embraced those design principles in the way that we develop our micro-credentials. So um, you, we don't have the time today to go really deeply into um, this resource, but if you are um, in the landscape of micro-credentialing and you're thinking about, so what does design look like? What, do, what are those things we need to think about in terms of assessment and implementation? Then I wanted you to be able to have um, access to this document. Um, 
the document really helps us to understand that in micro credentialing that there it's an ecosystem it's a lot of interchangeable working parts and um, it, it has four distinct roles so you have issuers who are sometimes also the developers of the micro credential um, those are the folks that identify a need that exists and then develop a learning opportunity through a micro credential for educators to earn so then that's the second role, that of earner. That's the educator who either through their own self-reflection and their own professional growth planning um, identify a particular need that they have and then they seek that learning through a micro-credential or it could be through a coaching relationship through an evaluator or a peer coach who suggests to someone, you know, you invited me into your classroom, you wanted me to kind of watch your, um, your engagement strategies and here's the data that I noticed and you know let's maybe go consider one of these micro credentials um, and, and let's find one that very specifically meets your need so that is um, the role of the earner and then the assessor who sometimes is the issue and developer and sometimes it is it is not but that is the person who through the criteria that is clearly defined in the micro credential gives the earner feedback whether or not you met the criteria and if you did not what you need to do in order to do that and then that last one is is so important and that is the role of the recognizer who is Give, who is giving the hours to the teacher if they are doing it for, for professional development hours, who is um, in some states, you can use micro credentialing as part of a um, relicensure process. So how are we recognizing these micro credentials and their currency for um, advanced learning? Um, I borrowed this and I gave credit. I borrowed this this um, graphic from digi uh, a joint report by Digital Promise and Getting Smart, Getting Smart, that kind of shows that that flow of how a micro credential is earned. So an issuer, like I just you know talked about before identifies the competency creates the learning opportunity for someone for an educator to earn a micro credential they establish the requirements micro credentials very clearly define what it is that an, that an earner has to do in order to pass the micro credential in order to earn that micro credential so then the earner spends that time however long it takes that individual earner to research and learn and practice and collect artifacts and reflect on that art and those artifacts to meet those requirements that were defined by the issuer. They then submit those artifacts in the format that the issuer had requested them, them in. And then the, the credentials are awarded and then they have the ability to be shared. So this flow chart really helps us to understand a little bit about that process. It is, it's important, you know, in this, on the slide, you see an image of one of CAVEX um, badges, one of our micro-credentials um, badges. And those badges have metadata embedded in them. So if I earn a micro credential and I receive that badge, I can put it in my portfolio, my electronic portfolio. I can put it on my email signature. I can send it to my evaluator and they can click on that badge and they can see then who issued the micro credential as well as what were the competencies that were defined in order for me to earn that micro credential so this really gives the um, that, that's where the word credential comes from it is it is recognition um, of a skill that I have earned I think one of the best ways for us to totally wrap our mind around what a micro credential might look like is to look at one and so I wanted to kind of take us through that. So you have to bear with me just for a moment while I do a new share. Jennifer, we have some questions in the okay. chat box. Okay, so now's a good time. Uh, can micro credentials be offered from a multiple choice? Uh, my, uh, um, let's see, without an artifact being evaluated. 
the way the, the national, that's a good question. Thank you for bringing it to my attention, Bernadette. The way that we define micro-credentials through that national collaborative is that a earner does submit evidence and artifacts of their professional learning. So that can be video, it can be audio, it can be lesson plans, it can be samples of student work. There are so many different ways that an, earn, that an earner can demonstrate their professional learning. But let's go back to that whole, um, to the original thought that we had is that a micro-credential is about clinical practice using it in the classroom and collecting the evidence. So there does need to be some evidence of implementation in the classroom. Um, some micro-credentials, you do not have to have student work or student artifacts. It depends on the design. So some of them may ask a teacher to develop a lesson plan and an assessment and then reflect on that against standards or against a certain design principle, but there, there is usually an artifact that goes along with that. Jennifer, we have one more quick question from okay. Clarissa. What is the general timeline for earning a badge since this is a learn and do, not a sit and get activity? These, you all just make me so happy. <laughs> this is the greatest group ever. So when we think about that, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you sort of that wishy-washy answer and then I'm gonna tell you why I give it to you that way. It depends. And the reason that it depends is because earners come into micro-credentials at different stages of learning. So if I have, let's, let's use balanced assessment as an example. In our state, we have, we have used a, a lot of Rick Stiggins' work around balanced assessment. So I may have a strong understanding of that. A new teacher comes on staff and they have not had that opportunity. So I may not need to spend as much time on the research and the resources on my developing my professional learning as a new teacher does. So there's really not a timeline. It is, it's personalized. That timeline is personalized. And that is one of the greatest things about the micro-credentials that we host on the Digital Promise platform is there's no ticking clock that if I start one, and then I go a month or two and I don't work on it anymore. And then I come back to it and work on it some more. It's still there. So time is really not the currency. Learning is the currency. And I think that is an excellent, an excellent question. Okay. So um, I'm going to ask my helpers in the room if you all see the digital promise page. Yes. Okay. So good. I got you where you needed to be. <laughs> It's half the battle. So what you're looking at is the Digital Promise platform, which is the platform that we use to host our micro-credentials. And the reason that we use um, Digital Promise is because early on, as we were um, new in the work of micro-credentialing, we really formed a great thought partnership with Digital Promise. And um, they, helped, they really helped us with our thinking. And um, they had a platform that would allow educators to access micro-credentials. And so ours are hosted there. There are other um, agencies and organizations that host micro-credentials, but ours are actually hosted on the Digital Promise platform. You can search for micro-credentials by topic. You can search for them by issuing organization, or you can search for them by stack, which means micro-credentials that are a progression of learning around a certain certain topic are stacked together. So I am showing you our page that has the micro-credentials that we have developed so far. And I wanted to take you down to this stack about teaching rural students from poverty. We are very blessed here at KVEC that we have folks on our staff. We have Dr. Desi Bowling, our Associate Director, and um, Bernadette Carpenter, who are um, trained. Um, they're Ruby Payne trainers, and we have other staff who've gone through extensive training with Ruby Payne and Eric Jensen, and because we serve students from poverty, and we have identified that as a need. So we are creating a stack of micro-credentials for teachers who teach rural students of poverty. So a third one is about to be released around culturally responsive pedagogy, but we so far we have two developed in this stack. 
understanding types of poverty and building relationships. And so I want to just click on the understanding types of poverty micro credential so that you can see what this looks like on our platform. You can see the word free <laughs> that kind of lights up like a neon light. Right now, KVEC is offering our micro credentials um, for free. Um, and, and that may change as, um, as, as use increases and our ability to turn them around quickly in terms of assessment. We may need to, to start to charge a small assessment fee, but right now they are free. And if an educator decided, they, they go onto our page and they read through this micro-credential and they decide, that's it. This is the one that I need. This meets my needs. If they do that, then they are able to click the apply button, which takes them to a portal where they can um, cut and paste from a Word document or whatever to, to upload their um, artifacts. But I just wanted to show you that this micro-credential follows those design principles that I mentioned earlier that were from CCSSO and several other national partners. So you see in this box next to the badge that shows um, a family that the competency that this micro-credential sets out to address is that an ed the educator demonstrates knowledge of different types of poverty and their effect on student learning. That is what this might, that's the competency, the discrete skill this micro credential is setting out to help, a, help an earner demonstrate. The next part is the key method, and that explains that research based, research backed method that the educator is going to use to prove that they have demonstrated that competency, that they have mastered that skill or competency. And in this one, what we're asking educators to do is to analyze many different types of student data. We know a lot of times that teachers analyze um, accountability data. But we're asking teachers to analyze demographic data and perception data. And we're asking, educate, we're asking educators to analyze program data or process data to really start to understand the students that they serve and to deepen their understanding about those students and where they come from. So they're, of course they're going to analyze their free and reduced lunch data, but they also might start to analyze who lives at home with their grandparents, who lives in a home that doesn't have um, transportation, who's not able to participate in extracurricular activities, and they really start to develop a really deep understanding of those students that they serve. And then we ask them to take that data that they collect and to put it into a visualization that helps them make sense of the data. So now I can start to understand 50% of my kids live in a home with someone other than their parents. So what does that mean in terms of instruction? If I'm sending home lots of homework and they're living with grandparents who haven't been in a school in 30 years, that might be a problem. Or if I'm asking students to you bring in a trifold science board so that we can create a science project and they don't have a car and the closest store is the Dollar General 20 miles down the road, they're probably not going to come with a trifold board. So I have to really have that data about my students to understand my role as an educator with them. And this this data, a lot of times, is data that teachers get randomly. They might be in the teacher's lounge and someone says, did you know that Johnny lives with his aunt? Or did you know that Billy's dad is in prison? Or did you know that um, Susie's um, grandmother passed away and now the grandfather's trying to raise them all those kids by himself? You get that kind of haphazardly. But to really make a focused effort to gather this kind of data about your students and then process it into, so what are the instructional implications because of that data? Really, we really believe that is a competency that teachers of rural students of poverty need. And then the method components, the next section of this micro-credential is 
I call it, and I'm showing my age here because some of you may not even know what these are. I call these the cliff notes. This is like the summarized information that an educator might need in order to understand this key method and what this competency is about. It's not enough learning to earn the micro credential on its own, but it really helps to frame the learning. So there are six types of poverty and there are different types of student data that an educator has access to that they may not always be collecting and analyzing. And that there are ways to create data visualizations so that I can not only have that data at a glance, but I can share it with the teacher down the hall who also sees these students. Or when I'm having conversations with my principal about needs I have in my classroom, I will have these data visualizations to show my principal, let me show you the students that I have in my class this year. Let me show you a little bit about them. So really helping them to create those data visualizations and how to share those findings with other stakeholders. And then the next piece goes along with that question about how long do I spend on this. Depending on how much I know about teaching rural students of poverty, I might need to spend quite a bit of time on this research section, which takes the earner deeper into the deeper into the required learning. So I may be reading things from ASCD that Eric Jensen wrote, or I may be reading things from Ruby Payne, or I may be reading things about data from Victoria Bernhardt. I have access here to other research, but an earner is not limited to this research only. They may go on to, to learn more, they may start reading some published dissertations about teaching rural students of poverty, or they may um, have access to other resources that we have not linked here. But these are key research pieces and resources, which are sort of teacher or educator friendly tools to help that earner develop their knowledge base in order to be able to demonstrate this skill. Jennifer. Uh, we have a question um, to clarify this micro credential is specifically demonstrating knowledge explanation of poverty but does not address strategies for working with these students is that correct that's correct this this is about the way a teacher begins to learn about the types of poverty that are in their classroom and collect that data as we progress through the stack that we are developing, we are starting to get into the strategy. So I say we have another one that is soon to be released on culturally responsive pedagogy. So those are the teaching strategies. And then we have another one that's coming out on interventions because a lot of times um, interventions are viewed as punitive in nature. You know, I didn't get it the first time, so now I've got to go do it again. So how do we address rural students of poverty in a positive way with interventions? So in this stack, there will be more learning opportunities that come along that will help to address those strategies. So this is a, this is a discrete skill. How do I collect the data about my students and how do I organize it and share it? That's what this one is about. Again, you all are Awesome with the questions. Good job. So the next part of this micro credential, again, following those design principles, is the submission. And um, at all of KVEX micro credentials follow this model of a three part submission. So the first part is that chance for the educator to provide an overview, to um, explain their context explain the grade level they teach, where they teach, um, the number of students in their classroom, or if it's a principal, a principal of a, um, a school with 400 students and 30 staff, and just, just so that the, the assessor can get a picture of where this is coming from, but also so we can think about the um, environment in which this learning is being applied. So this is a little bit about the context and it usually includes some sort of a question about what data 
drove you to this micro credential? Why did you select this? What, what was it you were trying to address um, that helped you select this micro credential as a, as a solution to a professional learning need that you had? And then the second part is, so we kind of think about this as a sandwich. We have that first layer, what's the context? So now we're going to get to the meat where we look at the work examples and the artifacts. So thinking about what we said the skill was, the skill was about um, collecting the data and creating a data visualization. Of course, the scorer is going to want to see that data visualization. They're going to see what data you collected, how you organized it, and what that data told you. How did you collect it? How did you organize it? How did you share it? And what are those implications for instruction that you're taking away from this aggregation of data? And then the last part is, and we always include this because we truly believe that it's important, is the reflection. And that gives the earner a chance to reflect on what they learned and how they are going to move forward with that learning in their professional practice. So I think we wanted to give you an opportunity to just see one and then see how we have taken, that, taken those design principles for the development of a micro-credential and applied them to, um, to the ones that we have developed. So again, I'm not going to go over these. We looked at these um, as in, in the example of the micro-credential of, you know, what's the skill, what's the method, how am I going to demonstrate that? And how is it going to be scored? So um, I, I don't think, obviously you're here because you're interested in micro-credentials, so I don't have to sell you on the benefits of micro-credentials, but some of the things that we think about in terms of the benefits, of course, is that about um, the flexibility of time, but also the flexibility in how the learning is demonstrated, um, the opportunities for collaboration, and then that impact. Really, really KVEC views professional learning, effective professional learning has an intersection. It has an intersection of improved professional practice. At the same time, we have an, an advancement of student outcomes. We see an impact on students. So micro-credentials helps you to capture both of those. You can see and hear from the educator on how this improved professional practice, and then you can see evidence of impact on student outcomes. And you can feel free in the chat box to drop some other benefits that you see to micro-credentials, um, but they are just an exciting way for educators to engage in professional learning that, that kind of um, replaces that traditional, in our, in our state, it has been so much focused on districts trying to find free professional development to meet the mandate and um, allow folks to earn their professional development hours. So this is, this is such a um, more relevant, rigorous, high quality opportunity for professional learning. Um, learning Forward, which has developed what has been recognized as the national professional learning standards and Kentucky has adopted as their own professional learning standards. Um, those are what you're looking at on the screen and you can you can insert micro credentials into every one of these standards as and say yes it does this that it allows teachers to work as part of a professional learning community it has a way for um, leaders to work with teachers to help them select the most relevant micro credentials it allows the and the data piece it allows them to um, look at a variety of student data collect data as they are engaged in the learning all of these can be can be checked and I want, I want to kind of skip ahead a little bit because I want to tell you that, you know, this is happening. And what you see on your screen here is a picture of a very happy group of educators. <laughs> These are all teachers at Allen Elementary School here in our region. And every one of those teachers successfully earned a micro-credential. And um, they will tell you as they were doing it, they weren't so sure they were going to do it, but they made it. And they're their administrator, um, Rachel Kreider is their principal. She really lifted them up and incentivized the work. 
gave them opportunity to work on their micro credentials in their professional learning community, gave them opportunities to come meet with me after school if they had questions, I don't know how to do this, I need help. Um, but they had fun. And on this day, we had a a great celebration and there was food and then their principal surprised them all with a t-shirt that said you can't if you have really great eyesight which obviously I do not with these bifocals on but their t-shirts say increasing potential with micro credentials so they were all so happy that they did that but they worked together early in the school year to identify a problem of practice that they had in their school that they felt like if we work on this problem of practice as a team, it's going to improve our outcomes. They selected the area of student engagement and then those teachers selected a micro-credential in that area of student engagement and worked in grade level and content area teams in order to be able to do that. And the administrators earned the micro-credential too. And I think that really helps set the stage um, and model what it looks like for a school to work together as a professional learning community. So they made micro-credentials part of a system. It didn't happen in a silo. They chose the micro-credential based on data, they worked on it together, they supported each other through the process, and then they they had a celebration and they have been a great source of information to us at KVEC about the lessons learned through this process. How can we help other schools also engage in micro-credentialing? Um, skip ahead a little bit more. We also did some research here at KVEC. Um, I did it as part of my doctoral work to actually compare. We took a hundred um, took 100 teachers, 50 who engaged in traditional professional development, which was usually that district organized professional development that happened at the beginning of the year, and 50 teachers who engaged in micro-credentialing. And we really had um, looked at this research question of who, who's, who did better in terms of improved professional practice, who did better in terms of student outcomes, and which educators had a higher perception of their professional learning as aligned to learning forwards standards for professional learning. So I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit and tell you that you, I know you don't want to read all about T scores and Z scores and because I didn't want to learn all about that either but but I had to. Um, what we found is that when we looked at the teacher professional practice ratings of the teachers who engaged in traditional professional development versus those who engaged in, in um, micro-credentialing, their professional practice ratings, there was not a statistically significant difference. And the reason is that it, this is a common problem in states that use frameworks for teacher evaluation. Teachers tend to be rated high on that scale. So the teachers who were in traditional, the teachers who were in micro-credentialing, they were all being rated high. But what we did find is that in terms of student performance in our state, we have a requirement to utilize an interim benchmark assessment. And our, our schools use MAP. We did find that teachers who engaged in micro-credentialing had statistically significantly higher student scores between the fall administration and the spring administration of the MAP assessment than did those teachers who engaged in traditional professional learning. And we also found Learning Forward gave us permission to use their Learning Forward's standard assessment inventory, they call it the SAI, which measures teachers' perception against those standards that I showed you earlier from Learning Forward. And again, it was statistically significant the number, the percentage of teachers who felt like through micro-credentialing that their professional learning best mirrored those standards. It was statistically significantly higher for those teachers who engaged in micro-credentialing than those who engaged in traditional professional development. I have included lots of data here and um, you will, like I said, you will have access to the um, PowerPoint. So if you really have trouble sleeping at night and you want to read all the statistical things about the null hypothesis and the T-scores and the P-score, P-values, 
here it is. This is your solution for insomnia. But we really do believe that those, the micro credentials were having the impact on student outcomes and the quality of professional learning that the teachers felt that felt they were getting. That takes us back to what our commissioner said, legislators were hearing that the professional development didn't have value. These teachers felt like it had value. We identified some things that we wanted to do some further study around. Um, we want to look more at educators who all earn the same micro credential, how that impacted their professional development and their student outcomes. We want to look at the impact of micro credentials on educator professional practice with some sort of valid rating, where we quit having those inflated teacher ratings. But this gave us some implications for further study. Um, you saw where our micro credentials are housed. Um, another exciting piece of work that we are engaged in and about to release, I think, eight more. Um, we've launched into bringing in those practitioner experts, that idea about building capacity and um, strengths versus deficit model. Our co op, our special education co op, and our regular education co op combined forces brought in practitioner experts from our region to develop a stack of micro credentials for special education teachers. So those teachers and administrators, some were administrators, learned together about how to develop micro credentials. They created that framework. They identified what the sources of evidence would be for, a, for an educator to earn this micro credential. And then they will become part of, they will be trained in how to assess and they will become part of the assessor pool of, of these micro credentials as well. So there will be 12 of those that will be released in addition to those five that we were talking about from the rural students of poverty. And then others that we develop based on need based on the need that we see from our region, based on the work, the collaborative work that we do through our networks, we will identify more for development. So our next steps as a co-op is to um, continue our work with our state agency to, um, to recognize earners of micro-credentials so that they, um, there is a possibility in our state for educators to, um, earn a rank change through professional learning and micro credentials can be a part of that. And we are continuing, like I said, continuing to develop micro credentials based on need. And we want to continue this. We found this to be very successful, continue this work with our stakeholder partners to advance micro credentialing as part of that professional learning system within our region and beyond working with other national partners, working with you, if it is something that, um, that, that we can partner with you to help advance the work, because we truly believe that we can learn from each other. So um, thinking about, you just drank from a fire hose, all this information about micro-credentials, um, think about and reflect on, so what would your next steps be? You know, is there something that uh, that you heard today that you want to go learn a little bit more about? Do you need? Do you want to explore some micro credentials? Do you want to um, make a connection with KVEC and talk to to Robert or myself or other staff members about ex further exploring micro credentials? But don't just leave today with, "Wow, that was great information," or that was good information, whatever your perception is. Leave with some very definitive next steps of, of how you can continue your learning. And I hope that one of your next steps is to join our next session of our virtual micro-credential summit. So I think I might have no minutes left, but let's see if there's any more questions or any feedback. Last question, Oh, I see it. Okay. okay, Amy had a question. How many have taken a course at one time? Oh, like how many have engaged in a particular micro credential at a time? Yes. Oh, well, um, I, yes. So looking at our, our numbers, looking at our statistics, right now um, we have awarded over 
269 micro credentials. So I think the one of our micro credentials that has had the two of them are the most popular. One is the one that we looked at, understanding types of poverty, and the other is developing an instructional strategy checklist. And both of those are in the 80s and the numbers of folks who have taken and successfully earned that micro credential. Um, so, you know, there is no real limit on the number who can who can take a micro credential at a given time. Um, the issue lies in the ability of the assessors to get them turned around quickly because what we want when someone submits theirs to be assessed we don't want them to wait a long time we want to be able to get that feedback to them as quickly as possible so that if they were successful they can celebrate and if they need to do just a little bit more to to earn that micro credential then while that learning is fresh in their mind they can go on to do that uh, she also had a had something to add to that. Over what period of time, though? Over, I'm not, not sure, sure I understand the question. question. I don't know if you're able to hear me, but I can. What I'm trying to ask is that you said that you credentialed 80 people in that one uh, micro credential. Oh, you yeah. had 80 or something. Is that 80 for the entire year, or you had 80 people enrolled in the month of March that were oh, all? Oh, oh. I see, Amy. I'm sorry. It, it's over a period of time since that micro credential was released. That's how many have earned it. Yes, and you know, so it. Our, I, we have a dashboard that kind of shows us like how many people are currently working on this micro credential so that we can be prepared. Because I don't want to wake up one morning and have 300 that need to be assessed. Um, so we can kind of keep tabs on that. Um, so. You know, we're still we're still new in this work, and um, I think the most that I have ever seen that of a particular micro credential to be in progress was 52, and I was really worried that one day I was going to log in and it was going to say, "Okay, there's 52 that need to be scored," and I was going to have to be rounding up scores. So that's that's an excellent question, Jennifer. We have a another great question from Angelique. What is the perception of micro-credential efficacy by teachers? And do you know if any districts okay. have offered steps on the pay scale as incentive? So we do have two districts in our region that are considering for next year offering pay incentives for teachers who earn micro-credentialing. And we have done some um, micro grants, some action research grants with to some of our um, schools that have been in our activating catalytic um, transformation work to help incentivize earning micro credentials it wasn't actually a pay increase that would actually go you know through perpetual perpetually on their on their contract but they would get a, a financial incentive um, so we do have some districts that are exploring that but we also know there are other states that are doing that as well um, we're really excited about the fact that Kentucky has um, released this option for for co-ops or districts or universities to create a pathway to a rank change. So in our state, teachers go through ranks. So when you first come out of school, you're a rank three and you earn your master's and you're a rank two, and then you earn an advanced degree over that and you're a rank one. Well, in our state now, there is an option that if it meets the criteria set forth by our standards board, that a teacher can earn a, a, pay, a, a step up in rank, which would also equate to a pay raise. So those options are there and they're definitely worth talking about and exploring and um, thinking about what, um, you know, looking at what Kentucky's doing and what the other states are that we know of that are doing that work as well. And I am going to turn it back over to Robert because he's telling me I've talked too long, but I have enjoyed this very much if my email is up there. And uh, I would love to connect with you more if it's something that you want to talk about. Well, Jennifer, thank you. That was absolutely awesome. And it's sad that we've run out of time because there are so many other questions that are coming in and that we can talk to. Uh, some of the questions that you've had, uh, I'm going to use this as, a, as an in incentive to entice you to ch come to our other sessions because we'll be going in depth on our stacks and why we've chosen certain stacks, talk about how teachers are using that talking about how uh, state departments are working together 
uh, or, or in different places with microcredit development, how districts and universities are working together. Uh, currently, Kentucky, we're working on plans uh, with districts, uh, universities, uh, cooperatives who can develop plans for continuing education option that includes micro-credentials that would result in uh, incentives and rank change. And universities and districts and some of those proposals are working together to develop that plan. Uh, so we're excited about uh, the, the work that we're doing. We appreciate Jennifer and her time that she's given her expertise. And I encourage you to look at her research and look at the findings that she has found uh, with, within that uh, in her work. Uh, and we hope that you can join us on June 30th as we get into our, our stacks more deeply and listen to those who have developed the stacks and the research that went in as the work towards development was happening. Uh, again, that is all the time that we have today. If you would like to have continued conversations privately, Jennifer and I or it would both be willing to have conversations with you via the phone. So you have our email addresses and you can contact us. It will be happy to set up the meeting with you. And with that, uh, and using our typical language at the end of our holler, holler sessions uh, on holler.org, we'll holler at you later.